for this roundtable. Um, th this is a very, um, uh, this is a little Oprah moment here um, with the roundtable. Um, for those of you who have been on our website, um, if you click on our news and events um, and you go down to the, like, the first one, we had a roundtable um, sort of like this for Workplace Flexibility 2010. Um, that was just sort of the beginning of us thinking about these issues. And this is a slightly different roundtable because it's part of the conference and having the mixture of the research, business practice, and policy. But the goal is to follow up on the really wonderful conversations and presentations we had yesterday, to hear from some of the leading professionals in the areas of research, law, business practice, and policy about the ways in which those fields have developed over the past three decades and what we might hope for as we move forward. And I have to say I'm particularly pleased that we've been able to pull together here a combination of folks, um, both some of the longtime researchers from the Sloan family world, um, more recent policy folks who have become affiliated with the Sloan National Initiative on Workplace Flexibility, as well as additional leaders in this field who have been working for decades on complementary tracks to that initiative that was uh, launched five years ago. My hope is that the conversation we are about to facilitate over the coming hour will highlight both how far we have all come and the creative ideas and approaches currently in the air for moving forward. So we sort of started hearing a bit about how far we've come and how far we've yet to go, and this is really um, a, a, a goal of continuing the conversation. So Phyllis Moen, I'm going to start with you. Now, again, I'm not doing long bios. You've got that all in your you know, bio packet. I'm going to do a sort of two-sentence introduction of each person as I ask them a question. So, Phyllis, you are the McKnight Presidential Chair in Sociology at the University of Minnesota. And prior to that, you served for many years as the Ferris Family Professor of Life Course Studies and Professor of Human Development and of Sociology at Cornell. And in 1996, you received the first center grant from the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation to set up the Cornell, Cornell, Cornell <laughs> Careers <laughs> Institute. So here's my question to you in that. Can you tell us how you conceptualize that center? I mean, I know you had conversations with Kathy Christensen at the time. How you conceptualize that center, what you were hoping to do in that, and in particular, um, many of us have heard over the years about the focus of the Sloan Foundation's funding on studying middle income families, and I wonder if you could tell us a bit about the background of that, the rationale, how that shaped the research that you did. So Phyllis, sure, and just to let folks know, I've told everyone that they have about five minutes in which to respond. So. The, uh, the, if you looked at Cornell with a, a really uh, jaundiced eye, there was, there was myself and maybe one other person who was interested in work and family. So we had to package it in a way that would attract people who were studying um, uh, different organizational issues, different uh, family concerns, people who were interested in industrial psychology, organizational behavior, and we, so we called it the uh, Cornell Employment and Family Careers Institute with the notion that careers meant pathways because I was very interested and as was Kathleen and workers at all ages and stages of the life course as well as different cohorts of workers. So we wanted uh, something that was, uh, and Kathleen really wanted something interdisciplinary, and this brought those people out of the woodwork, and also multi-methods. Um, so we had qualitative and quantitative data. The life course framing, and uh, it really let us look at processes over time and and context, both the organizational context, the kind of thing that um, Monique Valcour studied, but also the couple context, which uh, I wrote with Stephen Sweet about uh, the idea that couples made had strategies and made decisions uh, as couples on how they're going to manage the multiple uh, balls in the air. 
It also allowed us to uh, uh, look at uh, organizations that people were in. So we knew we didn't want to do a random sample. We wanted to actually look at first six and then ten organizations so to capture the people who were interested in that kind of focus. A lot of this can be seen in our uh, It's About Time, Couples and Careers uh, edited volume where we had a faculty member and a fellow write each chapter. So you bring very diverse things, including um, uh, an economist looking at phased retirement in that. It was we were enabled to look at a, a lot of different things. <laughs> Kathleen really wanted to focus on the middle class, and, and Kathleen, you can correct me on this, <laughs> but it, because uh, to get a to get to those working families who were supporting themselves through wage income. So she didn't want people at the high end that uh, didn't have to work or people at the low end that had other sources of income support. She was interested in uh, what Theta Scotchpool calls the missing middle that aren't really looked at in most policy prescriptions or, um, or, or, or concerns. What we found, and we talked about this in the um, career mystique, is that these people are ones who really believed you could work hard and continuously and reach the American dream, only to find that this myth of hard work leads to success really didn't, um, for many people, it led to chronic job insecurity, chronic overload, and often being um, uh, laid off, downsized, or forced to retire early when you least expected it. So we saw more cracks in the American dream uh, that we wouldn't have seen if we didn't focus on this group. It was also interesting to notice the amazing amount of turnover. In, in the couples in our study, 60% had one or both spouses change jobs in the two years between surveys. Now, some of the job changes were within company, but most of them were not. They either left the workforce or changed jobs. So this dynamism we would not have gotten. Finally, let me just say that this work, this is cumulative because it's led me into what I'm um, doing now with support from Sloan as well as uh, NIH and, and part of a network at NIH to actually go into companies like Best Buy and actually look at a program they're trying to change. Yuri Brofenberg always said, if you really want to understand something, try and change it. And so we watched how flexible uh, policies uh, it, it called the results only workforce, both before and during and after that process worked. Well, that is certainly true if you want to you know, study something, try to change it. Um, we're going to hear from Susan Lambert in just a bit. Not yet, don't worry. Um, I did. I. I did let them know generally what I would ask them and what lineup they were coming in. But other than that, I didn't want to give them much else so that we could hopefully have some spontaneity. But certainly that business of trying to change it and then see about how to study it. Um, the other piece that I would actually like all of you folks to think about as you answer your questions. Um, the, the point that Carol brought up just at the end of the last um, session in terms of often the lack of diversity within the folks studying or working within the work-life um, arena and um, Kathleen's point about that we're not seeing that quite the same way in some of the aging conversations we had and then Susan's point of that there was this divide somehow work-life uh, um, and diversity. So sort of how, how you've seen that playing out in terms of your work. And though that is a nice way to uh, a segue to Donna Klein, who is Donna, you know, who certainly has worked with the diversity issues uh, uh, across the board. Um, one of the things that was very clear when I sort of was brought into this family in, in 2002 that there was not only a focus from the Sloan Foundation on research, but very much on using actual business practice as a very complementary mechanism to the research in terms of pushing forward for change. You know, that was, you know, sort of very clearly there, and you very much embody that, both in terms of the 17 years you spent at Marriott, so wait, we need your... I, 
Donna served as the VP of Workforce Effectiveness at Marriott Corporation, Corporation from 1985 to 2002 and then founded Corporate Voices in 2001. So both your, my question to you is, from your experiences at Marriott for those 17 years, sort of what is it that you learned about opportunities, challenges for companies, including perhaps some of how the diversity issue wraps mm -hmm. in or doesn't? And then second, how did you take that, those insights in terms of founding corporate voices and, and uh, how have you found that that has played out? Um, certainly. Uh, flexibility, at, I think Marriott began 15 years ago as alternate work, alternative work arrangements. That's really where it began in most companies. And what we did is create, you know, five models of flexibility. Well, in any kind of service organization uh, that managers have a broad scope of responsibility, they quickly want to and predictably want to turn that into a cookbook approach to management. So uh, rather than accepting it as a conceptual model, they, they looked at it as uh, very finite rules. And if you couldn't telecommute, then the flexibility conversation was nipped in the bud. If you couldn't job share, the flexibility conversation was nipped in the bud. It went nowhere. Uh, at Marriott particularly, they have a very strong norm of invented here. So we knew as soon as that failed, did not pick up a lot, a lot of support, that we needed to do our own internal research. So uh, actually with uh, WFD, we did a big project in Boston with three, mod three different hotel types, you know, a conference hotel, a, an airport hotel, as well as a residential kind of hotel or a vacation hotel, to really determine exactly what, and it was a nine-month study, to determine what we could actually do to make flexibility more organic. And it was wildly successful, the project. We ended up reducing real management time. We reduced, uh, increased uh, loyalty. We, uh, uh, we, uh, increased recruitment and retention um, had advantages there and actually the program was cost neutral so we really went down and did job redesign and the cost neutral portion was very very important to the company going in because they weren't going to implement it if it would cost them anything um, but then when you get down to the hourly ranks and a company like Marriott is 85 90 percent hourly employees uh, in a 24 7 business operation uh, the the, the line people who actually do the work, it's a whole different ballgame than management. Um, and uh, we are uh, at, at the property level at Marriott, and this is why this has been important to me to bring it up the last couple of days, flexibility has been very organic. Um, because um, as, a, as a wise employer, um, you learn very, very quickly that you cannot uh, uh, punish people for living up to their own personal responsibilities, family or otherwise. And even today, a line, first line manager at a hotel will spend, human resource manager will spend 50% of their time working out the weekly schedules, and they're published bi-weekly, to meet everybody's uh, own individual needs. Who has to go to the doctor? Who has to go to school? And it's really a very, very time-intensive process. But nonetheless, it's organic. And it has historically been that kind of a process, which was perceived as a win for the employee, but not a win for the company. For the company, it was perceived as an accommodation. So we quickly recognized that we're obviously an accommodation is not sustainable as a business practice or as a policy. Um, we are, so we began uh, doing research, which we're currently engaged in now with Sloan support and with uh, WFD's support. Uh, it's six companies who have successfully implemented hourly flexibility, six different, uh, and di six different segments, uh, industry segments. So we have some financials, we have the hospitality industry, we have some, uh, I forget else who has that study, but nonetheless, six different companies, and they've done it successfully, so our challenge now is to really document what they've done su successfully and make that available to companies because that will obviously impact sustainability. Um, no, that's yes, good, good, because the thing is, uh, this feeds nicely into Heidi, and um, can you actually, I realize we don't need this, and I wonder if I can just turn it off. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you Barbara. <laughs> Barbara, you don't want to have that little light on you? Um, so, um, I mean, I think part of the story here is, is um, 
Yeah, we have come a long way. We've got a long way to go. I mean, I know people must say this over years. Don't you feel like, I feel like I was saying that 10 years ago on other issues I've worked on. And, you know, but the fact is, there really is something about figuring out what changes we have done. And from where you started at Marriott 17 years ago to now getting six different industries wanting to work with you, you know, and trying to figure stuff out, that is a movement. Mm -hmm. Now, how we then build it together to go to the next step, that's, that's, um, that's another question. And I think um, one of the things that we are doing somewhat differently at this Sloan conference than at others is expanding out of just the, the Sloan family researchers and advocates and, you know, making sure that we've, you know, sort of bring in the, the people who have been working in this for decades, even if they haven't been working within this arena. And um, so, Heidi, um, you have a PhD in economics from Yale University. You worked for 30 plus years on the Washington policy scene. Though you've worked in academia, New School University, Rutgers, and in government, for example, U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, you've spent most of your career in nonprofit research organizations, first at the Nat National Academy of Sciences for eight years, and now 20 years at the Institute for Women's Policy Research, which you founded as the president. And one of the trademark aspects, I think, of IWPR has been its merit of research and public policy advocacy. <coughs> Um, as you said it to me, Heidi, I think it's safe to say that you try to influence the debate on Capitol, Hills and Capitol Hill and elsewhere through the research you and your colleagues do at IWPR. So given the broad sweep of activity that IWPR engages in, what do you see as the main challenges and opportunities for the development of public policies to advance workplace flexibility? as we broadly define the term, as you've heard over the conference of the last day and a half um, that brought. So what do you, and by the way, guys, this is a version of this question. What do you see as the challenges and opportunities for the development of public policy research? Is going to be something I'm going to ask a lot of these folks, but from their particular vantage point, either a particular research vantage point, business practice vantage point, or living in the policy world vantage point. So, um, Heidi, why don't you start us off on this part of that conversation? Well, I thank you for giving me such a narrow question. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> give me a great opportunity here to, to uh, opine. Um, first, I, I do want to say I do see great opportunities. We at IWPR are working specifically on um, short-term paid family leave and longer-term paid family leave, uh, both at the national level and the state level, and I'm, I want to uh, come back to that in a moment. I also first want to just say a couple of words about the role of research in this process. At IWPR, we are a policy-oriented think tank, but we do not lobby. On the other hand, we are frequently called upon as experts to testify, and if our research you know, supports a bill, we certainly endorse bills in that context context of being asked to testify as experts uh, before Congress or state legislatures. Um, I think someone, I heard someone say in the audience as we were discussing this in the last panel that research is necessary for change but is not sufficient. <laughs> and uh, one of the things uh, that um, I thought uh, Kristen Cielo expressed very well was that one of the roles that researchers can do is public education through the media. And that's a very important thing that academic scholars can do as well as um, think tankers uh, like myself. One of the things I've learned about research is that it's particularly important for your own side. Now, in this context, let's say we're all on the side of making progress uh, in flexibility and work and family. And rarely, while you might think your research is going to convince the other side, rarely do you actually convince anyone. It's really about strengthening and bolstering your side so that they feel really good and really empowered about um, the arguments that they're making. And uh, Peter Reinecke also said something very important about the importance of the victim, as uh, which is that is the person who suffers from this problem that you can bring as a witness. At IWPR, we joke about them and we call them victims. We say we need to find a good victim that can really make you know, a persuasive, uh, powerful case. And I used to be rather 
dismissive of that because, after all, you know, I love data and I, you know, we get these regression models and we want to present them and we want to talk about externalities and, you know, <laughs> and, uh, but they're very effective and I've come to see that, you know, as a very important part that usually the advocacy groups do in identifying persuasive people and, and helping them with their testimony and, and bringing them to the fore. So those, those three things, the, the basic research, the victim, and the media, I think, are the three components uh, that are part of the process. But the second point is that the biggest part of the process is working with the advocacy groups. As um, a couple of people said on the last panel, and Betsy Firestein, I think, spoke about yesterday, you, you really need to organize. What I'm hearing from staff on Capitol Hill is that part of the reason why these bills so far haven't gone too far, like the Healthy Families Act, which is the mandate to uh, require employers of a certain size to provide seven days of uh, paid sick or family care leave is that there's not enough co-signers, there's not enough momentum, they don't hear enough, they don't hear from a diverse coalition. And I, I want to uh, come back to that as well. Um, nevertheless, I think these are things that are moving in the right direction. The number of signers is growing. Uh, I think both Clinton and Obama signed on, so that's a good sign. Uh, the the longer-term leave bill that, that we would be working on, or at least working toward, is the Dodd-Stevens bill, which I mentioned yesterday, and Peter Stark has a version in the House, which is a social insurance-type bill, like Social Security or like the TDI programs that exist in five states and in California, where family care was added. And it's the model here for the federal level be paid for by both employers and workers, uh, and it would apply to everyone. Most social insurance programs apply to employers with even one employee. And while I'm very aware of the cost of these things, I, I want to make the point that we as a society have the, the right, and one might say the moral obligation, to make sure that the businesses that function in the U.S. meet minimum standards. Many small businesses get in trouble because they can't send in their Social Security payments or they're withholding, their IRS withholding on time. A lot of those businesses go out of business. That is the price of operating in the United States of America. We have a certain minimum standard. You must meet it. You must pay the minimum wage. You must pay Social Security. You must pay worker compensation. And I think the whole movement is about saying, you know, there's a lot of other capitalist countries in the world which have a lot higher minimum standards. And the same companies who operate here operate in Canada and operate in Europe, and they make a profit in those other environments where they, where they meet a much higher level of mandated standards. And we want to bring the mandated standards in the U.S. up to what is now considered a worldwide norm for an advanced industrialized country. So I think that the, there should be a lot of action on, on the mandate front. And the social insurance is perhaps a gentler form of mandate, but it's also very clearly a mandate. So those are two of the things we're working on now. And why do I see the possibility of progress there? Well, I hearken back to what happened with the FMLA in 1993. Let us uh, not forget that that mandate, which Republicans all take credit for now, was bitterly opposed by them and by most of the business community. And it passed, and this is my, I have one more point, so that it passed because we had a Democratic-controlled Senate and House they wanted to embarrass the Republican president, which was George Bush one, and they passed these, this bill twice, the FMLA. They passed it twice, and George Bush the one, the first, I like to call him, <laughs> vetoed it twice, and then it became well known. Now, uh, uh, until he vetoed it, nobody out there in the general public had any idea, even though there was a huge diverse coalition working for it. And then what happened? Well, that was an easy vote, even for the Democrats, because they knew it was going to be vetoed and they weren't going to be able to override. Well. Clinton got in as president, and then they had to stand by their vote. They'd voted for it twice, they had to vote for it again. And we had that two-year window where we had a Democratic president and a Democratic Congress. Now that window, hopefully, is about to open up again. And while we like to think that change is gradual, and certainly a certain amount of change is gradual, the huge periods of opportunity of social policy change in our country were in the 1930s and in the 1960s and early 70s. And I can only hope that we're going to be entering another one and that we need to take an opportunity of this uh, really unique historical circumstance where we may have uh, this political alignment. And I think because of the economy, because of 9-11, because of everything, because of what's been happening in health care, we have a hugely raised consciousness about the importance of health security to families and of economic security to families. So I am pretty optimistic that we may be able to get some real change um, in the next few years. Thanks. Great. Well, this is a perfect segue into you, Abby. 
<laughs> Abby Harrison, who's sitting right next to Heidi Hartman. Abby um, has been a um, uh, worked for a major management law firm um, here in town um, as an experienced employment attorney. Um, has frequently lectured on FMLA and ADA issues at employment law seminars, authored the Leave and Disability Coordination Handbook, so knows all about the FMLA stuff. Um, but also, as Heidi noted, you know, the staff on the Hill say, if you want some bill to pass, you need a diverse coalition to be pushing it, right? And... Um, Abby served for 18 months on our legal working group which um, of Workplace Flexibility 2010, where we brought, brought t uh, seven top management lawyers and seven, seven top employment lawyers to get together and talk about exactly these issues. Paid short-term time off, paid extended time off, paid episodic time off, flexible work arrangements, etc. Right? We brought it. And as Abby will remember, what we said to them was, we want all of you guys to imagine that you're in Venus. Okay? We're going to give you memos about how things work on Earth. Okay? Including... You know, what the law is here, what bills are being proposed, what laws are in other countries. Okay, we're going to tell you how things are on Earth, but then we want you to imagine if you were running the world, how would you set it up? Okay, so now people who are political, right? I mean, Abby, you know, is a litigator. <laughs> and she was joined by 13 other litigators, you know, who were representing either business or employees over the course of their experience. So my question, to, and, and we wanted to see whether we could have a reasonable conversation around these issues that might in fact result in a diverse coalition pushing for the one side that everyone agreed on in that diverse group was, yeah, we do want more workplace flexibility. Now, how we get there in the role of government, you know, that was not necessarily, you know, a coherent <laughs> view. So Abby, my question to you is, what was your sense coming into that process of the legal working group about what that group could, in fact, achieve in terms of any agreement on, you know, how to run things? And then how did you feel when you, when you finished? I mean, the group still exists now in tandem with the advisory commission, but what's yours? And you also changed jobs during the legal working group. Um, so I'd be curious about it, if that affected you in any way. Thanks. Um, actually, I was on Pluto when I got the call, so uh, I was a little skeptical about uh, getting together with colleagues, actually, that I knew and had litigated against, um, but fortunately, we w had not engaged in the scorched earth mentality, so we were able to be civil. Uh, and fortunately, we received excellent written materials uh, before each time we met, we'd get these wonderful three-ring binders with uh, articles and uh, information regarding European laws, state laws, and we really did dig deep into the discussion, um, and actually it turned out to be a very enlightening experience for me personally, um, as well as I think for everyone else. Um, a lot of times lawyers, because we're so busy with trials, we don't take the time to do other things, but this particular work group, was it was well attended. Uh, the attorneys showed up at the meetings or by phone and read the materials, um, and we really talked about the practical, the application of these laws and where are the flaws, um, what do employers have a hard time doing as far as compliance. It's wonderful to say that an employee has a right to ask for leave, but if you're a large employer or a small employer, the needs of the business, um, who does what kind of work, um, those kinds of issues come to the forefront. Uh, the fairness issue of if, if you have a number of people in the same work group, and you only have the ability to give two people flexible work schedule, that may result in a discrimination case. Um, when you talk about diversity issues and how managers see their workforce. Um, if I look like you, I might tend to give you more of a benefit than if I don't. Uh, that's the reality of the situation. The other issue was accountability. 
um, how much as far as the, the comments that you made about higher standards in other countries, um, how much paperwork uh, should you have to have as an employer to uh, justify denying a flexible work schedule or short time term off, time off? Uh, how much information as an employee should you have to present to the employer to justify the need? Those were the kinds of conversations that we had at each session to talk about what kind of public policy would be reasonable for both the employee and the employer to understand and then apply in such a way that it minimized litigation and disputes. And then to throw in on top of that another layer regarding collective bargaining and unions. And how the, you know most bargaining agreements have leave provisions and and negotiation and and those types of issues. So I think you know at the end of the day, it is possible for a dozen lawyers to agree on some things. <laughs> um, and we did agree, obviously, that there is definitely room for improvement. Um, and there is a definite need in every workplace to have these types of policies. Um, but the real question at the end of the day is to have an employer who's willing to do it. Um, and how can you build in incentives? And I think that, for me personally, um, advising management um, afterwards, I became general counsel during the course of this uh, for the D.C. public school system, which is a whole other day of conversation. But at the whole point of me advising internally was very different than external. Uh, because obviously then I had to look at all the labor agreements and advise principals and managers. And when you have hundreds of people making the decisions about leave and flexible work schedule, it's a mess. <laughs> so I think that um, from a very practical standpoint, while I have great hope mm -hmm. that improvements can be made even at the highest level of thinking, you can come up with a great policy, but the training and the application is where you have the problems, and that's where we focused on. So I, I really appreciate being invited to participate. Um, it's been a very worthwhile venture as far as I'm concerned. Great, and, and that is continuing on. The Legal Working Group is meeting at the same time as... Um, we all knew that it's a lot easier to talk about things on Venus than it is on Earth, right? And, um, you know, uh, this was a nice little juxtaposition right here of Heidi saying, look, there are some things that you just need a mandate. Look, this is what you have to do, you know? And Abby <laughs> still leaning a little more like, well, you know, mandates have all these other issues that sometimes arise and, you know, how can we incentivize? And there's no doubt that in terms of the public policy debate on this, whether you do something through incentives, whether you do something through mandates, whether you can do a mandate that is less of a mandate than the traditional mandate or an incentive that's more of an incentive than in a traditional incentive, I mean, this is part of the conversation that many, many of us are trying to have and think about in some creative way. So... I'm going to turn to Andrea LaRue next, who is very much on Earth, okay? <laughs> Andrea worked, um, she's now a partner at NVG, which is a Democratic-leaning lobbying firm whose five principles are all women and where flexibility is the workplace culture. Before joining NVG in 2003, she worked as counsel for Senate Democratic leader Tom Daschle and for the Senate Rules Committee, and prior to that, she practiced labor law. So, Andrea, when you worked from the Majority Leader Dashiell, you were responsible for, among other things, labor and employment issues. So I know you have battle scars <laughs> from that time period. So my question to you is, is everyone in this room maybe deluding themselves to be optimistic that we can make some change in this. And, and on that, I mean, there, you've heard, in a sense, two ways of possibly making change. Um, you know, Heidi's coming up, here we know already what we want. Here, I've got these bills, and it's just about getting that coalition going. 
Okay, so maybe it's optimism about that. Or you've also know, because you serve on a National Advisory Commission, that we at Workplace Flex 2010 have our own particular version of optimism, which is that we can actually come up with something that works for both employers and employees. So um, illuminate us on whether you think um, we should have optimism on either side. Well, um, thank you for inviting me. And um, I am excited to be on the National Advisory Committee um, because I, I do think I, I see a lot of obstacles, actually, to um, change. And so the lineup was really exciting. When you and Katie um, and Peter came and talked to me, I was very excited to be in a room with um, folks that I haven't agreed with. And um, I thought it was a good conversation to start because just like you all put so much work into preparing us to have a conversation, I do think a ton of work, like Heidi's work and other people around this table, has to go into a breakthrough from a public policy point of view. And, you know, I, I, it, it all kind of summed up for me when I walked into the first NAC meeting and I see, you know, there are VPs from major corporations and there are professors that I've, you know, pulled into projects because I know they know something that I want to know. And uh, sitting across from me is Helen Norton, who was kind of one of those people who was always pushing me to do the right thing when we were on the Hill. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then sitting next to me turned out to be Sandy Boyd. And Sandy was, um, while I was the person handling these issues for the Democratic Caucus, um, Sandy was the VP for the National Association of Manufacturers. So honestly, the only times I met with Sandy were meetings to have a disagreement. We weren't <laughs> trying to work through anything. I honestly think that the reason she would walk into the office is so that she could check the box mm -hmm. and say, I've talked to the, the Democrats. We've you know, we've tried to consult them. <laughs> and my point of having the meeting was to take all her talking points so that I could debunk them, uh -huh. write the point, you know, myth fact about everything she was saying, and then send it out to the Democratic caucus before. Mm -hmm. So, you know, to be sitting next to her was, like, quite fun. Um, and what was really fun was the fact that we started agreeing on things. Um, having been through those tense moments. I think that both of us, as we start talking about principles and what we would like to see here on Earth, we're really engaged by the tension between uh, wanting there to be buy-in from both the employer-employee side and wanting there to actually be an outcome, wanting to see change in the workplace. So not to make it so squishy that nothing's going to change, um, which goes to the whole mandate point. I, I think the thing that I learned from, I spent most of my time in the minority. And one of the things that I, what Heidi said just highlights for me is that there, no one really applauds the minority when they help the majority pass bills. So the culture of being in the minority is to stop things. Because that's what you get kudos for, that's what you get applauded for, that's how when people think you're a strong leader, a strong minority leader, it's because you stopped the majority leader from doing what the majority leader wanted to do. So I think that's the challenge of the next Congress. Um, it, it's not so much a challenge about what people who agree with each other can get across the finish line. The challenge is when will the minority leader, and particularly in the Senate, say, okay, I want to be part of this process? Right. Um, and, you know, that's depressing, maybe for some people <laughs> and sometimes for me. Um, but it is really the reality of how things get done. And I do think that that's what's so exciting about the NAC for me, is that I think that it's an opportunity for people who don't agree, building off the work Abby's group did, to vet ideas so that if we can come to some consensus, um, that we can we can try and try and find space where the minority can see a win. Right. Right. And so that's kind of what 
I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm excited. Yeah, and that is so perfectly well said. As someone who has been doing politics for 25 years now here in Washington, you know, and, you know, years with the Dems in control and years with the Repubs, and it's true, when you're in the minority, the point is to stop whatever the majority is doing. And, um, and that is one of the biggest challenges we have about trying to do it this different way. Because right. it means each side gives up their rhetorical talking point. See, each side gives up being able to say, we care about family. Because somehow they've now done it together. So, but here's the thing. In terms of the, um, my, my staff knows that I talk about um, meetings in, as, as if they're in, in, there's music, you know, like the beginning part and then the next. By the way, I know nothing about music. Um, so I really have no idea if this is a right analogy, but it's sort of like you're trying to move and this, and then you just, you know, you get to the end point and it's just all lovely. Um, so just to let you know in terms of my view of the movement here, um, part of what I wanted to get at first, I mean, first it's like the beginnings, Phyllis and Donna, right? Research and business practice. Then there's the, let's surface that there's a challenge here, <laughs> you know? Which way you go? Mandate incentives. How can you really, is that just dreaming to think about, you know, that we could really get the minority, whoever the minority is at that point, to work with the majority, okay? So just get a sense of that. Now, what I want to move into is, well, what might be the different levers, what might be the different opportunities that one could use to, in fact, make that point to the minority and the majority together? Of which some of them have come up over the last day. Different people have mentioned them. But we have people here now who can really speak either from a research or a business perspective to those levers. Okay, so I want to start on that with Marcy. Um, so, Marcy... You were one of the earliest leaders in the Sloan efforts in this area. You were recognized last year with the receipt of one of the 2007 Work Family Legacy Awards that Ellen's group gives out. Um, you conceptualized the idea of building a virtual community with the creation of the Sloan Work and Family Research Network, directing that network from 1995 to 2005. And as many of you know, there's going to be a tour of that website after the conference is over um, that Judy Casey will be running, we'll announce the room during lunch. Um, and then in consultation with Kathy Christensen and your colleagues at Boston College, you created the most recent center launched with Sloan, Sloan, funding, bleh, Sloan funding, the Sloan Center for Aging and Work. So part of what is particularly unique, I think, about the center is how you have been trying to integrate, integrate research business practice and policy in this area of aging and work. And so I wonder what you see as the opportunities in moving this forward to where we want to go in terms of the aging of the workforce. Sure. There, there are a couple of ways to think about this. I think um, the first point I want to make is that we really have an opportunity now for what some of the employer community has suggested to me is a renewal, if you will, of a commitment to um, certainly a range of quality management and employment practices focused specifically on workplace flexibility. I'll get to that in a minute, but I think in part there is a willingness to relook at either the alignment or the mismatch between the 21st century world workforce and the kinds of policies and practices. I'm going to spend most of, uh, I guess i got about three minutes left, most of my time focusing a little bit on the intersection between research and, uh, and practice at the workplace. Uh, but I do think that it is quite important also to understand that uh, there is an opportunity in part because we are at a unique point in time where there seems to be at least a confluence of interest. Now, I don't know about commitment to action, but in three groups that oftentimes are a little bit on, 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 on different time frames. And that would include um, employees themselves, and in this case, certainly the focus in this country is on the aging uh, of the workforce. There are certainly some employers who are paying attention to it, and uh, certainly policymakers uh, for different reasons. But I think that they have come to the conclusion that it, at least it's important to step back and look at uh, the potential significance of uh, this demographic shift. Yeah. <sighs> 
I think I want to start a little bit just to give a tiny bit of background in terms of why people are paying attention. And some of this is really obvious, but um, I want to make a little bit of a link back to the, um, you'll, you'll, you'll see that I, I do go back to in, in my, my age here, my perspective, but at the end of the 80s, um, there was a tremendous amount of attention focused on a report released by the Hudson Institute. And it uh, basically was a bit of a forecasting report indicating that the workforce is not going to be the same as it has been in the past. A lot of attention on certainly the entry of women into the workforce, uh, immigration, uh, people of color. And uh, again, it got the attention of a lot of employers. Now, some of them did something about it and some not. But I would suggest that we are at a similar threshold point right now because um, employers are noticing that certainly um, there's a pretty widespread consensus among the labor market economists, as I understand it, that there will be uh, increases in the labor force participation rates setting aside for a minute the, the composition of the, of the workforce, but the participation rates of our older workers. Uh, the estimates are as much as between 40 and 45 percent of those 45 to 54 and over 55. And I think from an employer's point of view, it's, it's not going to be the same workforce. And if they're interested in some of the conversations we had yesterday on engagement, they're going through a process of looking at alignment. I'm going to get to the flexibility in a minute, but I do want to share one anecdote at a recent advisory committee meeting of our employers uh, where we had and a very forward-thinking employer made the observation that the company knows they've got a 21st century workforce. They know it's changing by age and all sorts of other demographic characteristics. Uh, basically, he said we've got new ways to work. But he said a lot of our talent management processes are definitely 20th century, and I think there's a disjuncture there that they're paying attention to. So there's an awareness, but I want to just uh, spend a couple of minutes in terms of the so what of this, what are they doing? And this is where the story becomes a little bit complicated. Um, even in industry sectors uh, with occupation groups that are aging more rapidly than is typical, oftentimes you'll say, boy, you must be paying attention. And they say, yes, I'm paying attention. And what are you doing? And they'll say, not so much. Uh, we did a survey about a, a year and a half ago, and a fear, I thought this was a throwaway for employers, you know? So, so, you know, to what extent are you analyzing your workforce demographics? 25% said not at all. So, wow. <laughs> not at all. And so I think that we, we understand a little bit that there's this faltering, if you will, in terms of some of, of the response. It was even less for those who said they had projected the retirement rates. So I think that there's, uh, in one sense, an awareness, but the question about readiness is something we certainly need to think about. This is where we get into the issue of mismatch, match, alignment, and flexibility. And if one thing is consistent, no matter who sponsors the survey and what the sample is, that when you specifically focus on older workers and say, what's the one thing that's really important to you, whole cluster of things that are important, money being one of them, so I'm not ignoring that, but the far majority in every single survey indicate they want some form of flexibility. And most surveys would suggest that for those people who are over the age of 50, less than 10% say they want to continue if they're going to extend their labor force participation rates. Less than 10% say they want it full-time, full year. That's a small percentage. And so I think the issue of flexibility comes up. And I want to get back to the renewal conversation. When you talk to employers about this, it's very clear that uh, you know it, it, they feel it's in their best interest and their workforce's best interest uh, to start the conversation with this awareness of the preference, priority, and need of older workers for certain kinds of flexibility. But they also will very quickly say they recognize, first of all, that flexibility actually you know, it's not just good for older workers, maybe good for our business and for workers across the life course. And so I think that the process that they're going through is making these um, links with business flexibility and trying to implement it. I want to end with just two more quick data points because I think this is where the questions arise. Again, a single item. I'm not talking about the, the, the complicated interpretations of some of this. We asked them the extent to which they linked workplace flexibility with business effectiveness. And 
and there's been a lot of conversation about the glass being half full or half empty, and are we at a tipping point? The good news of this is over 50% said to uh, a moderate or great extent, but of course that leaves the other 50%. And the last thing I will say is, is the comment I suggested yesterday is that I think we need to be very careful not to do a one-off on flexibility, that it's a checklist if I have this one thing, we'll at least have done something and I move on. When we looked at the number of organizations that had six or more of the 15 in our little list, it was um, not even a quarter of them. And so to have flexibility is great, but if it's not the flexibility you need or want, then it may not be so useful. So it's something I think we need to keep in mind with older workers as well. Thanks. Great. Well, any company that in fact um, has projected their retirement you know, rates, you know, has done that analysis, has projected the retirement rates, and has enough money to hire Watson Wyatt, probably end up getting Tamika Hill. Um, so Tamika Hill is a senior research associate at Watson Wyatt Worldwide, where she has done considerable work on workforce planning and employee behavior towards pension plan design. She, um, together with another senior person at Watson Wild, Kyle Brown, have both been serving on our phased retirement working group that some of you may know. We've been doing for two years now a group of employer as well as employee perspective, but very much the political people as well as the people on the ground on pension and retirement, trying to work through if an employer, you know, who gets all this information from Marcy's job and understands, hey, I want to keep my older workers, but they're going to want flexibility, then I, then I want to work the same way that they did, you know, what sort of problems are they going to be bumping up against as a legal matter? Okay, so that's part of what we've been trying to explore systematically over the last two years with people like Tamika. So, Tamika, my question for you is, can you, in a way that our audience will understand and not glaze over, because I don't know that you want to read all our memos from the Phase of Time Reporting Group, um, but give them a sense of the challenges faced by employers who want to offer a phased retirement program, you know, and want to give a flexible work arrangement. So give them a sense of those challenges, and then maybe also a bit of a snapshot of um, sort of a version of the question I asked to Andrea, but in the specific particular political tensions of the phase retirement working group, whether you felt there was some reason for optimism or not in terms of just on that slice. All right, well, thank you very much. Um, companies that have a pension plan, a defined benefit plan that is offered to their workers um, there's a restriction in that they cannot provide in-service distributions of the, um, their pension. They cannot work and receive their pension simultaneously unless they're 62 years old or older. This is um, quite restricting to a lot of companies because they want to retain workers who are now eligible for early retirement, which is significantly younger, typically 50, age 55. So they want to provide an incentive to keep their workers so that they won't leave to go somewhere else or just leave and fall out of the workforce in its entirety. Um, this is one of the biggest issues that we're facing in the private sector in particular because a lot of companies are facing worker shortages in certain fields such as in truckers, nursing, and then a lot of companies are losing specific skilled workers. So they want to provide incentives for someone to stay a couple years longer because they want them to finish a project or they're very knowledgeable about uh, something and they want them to train the younger workers. And this is very interesting because in the private sector, this is used as a retention tool, a workforce planning tool, but this is totally different than what you will see in higher education, where in higher education you have these tenure professors who are 85, 90 years old, who are collecting a check, but not really that productive. I think some people in the, pro in the academic sector here know some of these people. <laughs> so there are a lot of universities who actually, instead of using phased retirement as a retention tool, are actually using this as a promotion, like, you know, kind of let go a little bit. We want to hire some new, fresh people to bring into um, our university. Now, one of the things that um, 
we've been talking about in our um, workforce group, or our phase retirement workforce group, that um, really I thought was very interesting, particularly in our last meeting, was when we were discussing, well, if 62 isn't the right age, then what is the right age? And there have been arguments um, that it should be higher. There have been arguments that it should be, you know, lower. And I think it just comes, brings to light, I think, the most fundamental um, policy question. Does phase retirement encourage or discourage retirement? And I think the question is, yes, it does <laughs> both. <laughs> I think it has to, it is very specific to the company, the workforce, how it's going to be used. And I think it's very important in our uh, organization, and hopefully we can come to a consensus with the organizations who are speaking on behalf of the employees, as well as organizations like my own who are speaking on behalf of the employers, that we can have um, a consensus in which, yes, a company can use base retirement to help retain their workers. We can offer flexible hours in the number of hours worked and the days worked. We can have seasonal employment, um, a job transfer to help. And, you know, there are workers there who want this as well. They don't want to go from working 40 hours a week to nothing. They want a gradual reduction in the hours work as they phase into retirement. But at the same time, it could still be used in higher education for people who are 90 years old, still collecting a lot of money as an incentive for some of these older workers that, okay, you don't have to completely stop working. Instead of you teaching two classes, you could just teach one. Um, instead of having your funding to be at a certain X level, it can be half that. But still, come to that uh, compromise so that a pr private sector company in particular won't use this to their advantage to try to push out a 55-year-old to replace them with a 25-year-old that's cheaper. So I think it's something that all three of us are really trying to work together. And I really do think, um, particularly at the last meeting, it was really good. And I think we really got a lot of things done that we can come to a compromise on this as well. Well, that sounds great <laughs> in terms of a possible optimism. I'm not sure that we... Um, <laughs> Uh, well, we continue to be optimistic because there's no way to do this work without being optimistic. <laughs> Otherwise, why get up the next day, right? But I think part of what I'm also wanting to highlight from this is that there are levers that can be pushed, but each lever is itself complicated, you know, especially if what you're trying to do is get something that will work well for both employers and employees, and you can't always get that. Right? I mean, that's not going to happen all the time. And so, and especially in public policy, where you're trying to figure out something that will work in a way um, for lots of very individualized different situations. Now, I do think it's possible, but this is just about highlighting both that opportunities for leverage and then the complications in the leverage. So continuing that theme, so we heard a bit in terms of aging, I want to move down here to Barbara Kathleen, Schneider. Kathleen, don't leave. Kathleen. <laughs> Kathleen, you have to come back in here. No, you can't go because you have to. She's going to talk. She's going to call on me next. And I just That's feel it's really important for you to hear. No, I will talk I really fast. We are in the bathroom, Kathleen. I will talk really. I will talk really fast here. Don't worry. Okay. Um, I could try to fill up the time, but it's not okay. Well, I um, could just talk about what is the biggest lever of change. I mean, what has really been the biggest lever yeah. of change? And the biggest lever of change has been the vision of yours. And many people up here have thanked the Sloan Foundation, but I don't think that they really understand the scope of what you're thinking and the ideas that have really moved this all forward. And that has to do with Kathleen Christensen. We're looking at almost $100 million of support. Oh, $100 million of support, centers that have changed careers, and moving an idea forward that has really substantially changed not only the dialogue, but the activities of people that are in this field. And I don't want all of us to think that this isn't the most important lever, because it is. And if you all wouldn't mind, I'd really like to applaud Kathleen and say thank you.
And just so you get some idea about how effective her levers are in terms of research, we funded over 20 graduate students who ended up in academic positions. And we started out in 1997. And of those 20 students, five of them are now fully tenured professors at Research One institutions studying issues related to work and family. So um, it's really important to talk about this. We collected a 500 data set that every person in this room can get access to at ICPSR at the University of Michigan. So if you want to know what the University of Chicago Center on Parents, Children, and Work did, and you want to replicate what we did or prove us wrong, go to that data set and you'll be able to. Um, and in terms of um, the discussion we're having right now um, in tr for with respect to older workers, um, Older workers, flexibility, retirement, great subjects for my colleague. This is what she studies. This is what she knows. These are the levers that she can talk about. The levers that I can talk about are middle class families with children and how they think about work. And it's a little bit different than 90 year olds. I don't have any 90 year olds in our sample. In fact, I think we cap at 56. Um, but these are people who work for lots of hours, lots and lots of hours. And the important thing to remember about putting together levers here is one that most of them really don't want to work all these hours. Um, there's no question they would prefer to work less, um, especially the women. But the bottom line is that there's a culture out there and the culture starts within the person. And the person feels and I'd like to uh, just weigh in on this, that all of us like to work, regardless of um, how much resources we have or don't have, but work brings structure and meaning to our lives. Um, and these people really enjoy their work, and they get something from their work emotionally that they don't get in any, any other aspect of their lives. And so they go to work, and they put in these enormous hours overworking. So the question is, is there a way to alter that perception. And for those of us who've worked in Sloan, for us it's a conversation because this requires a whole cultural or different cultural orientation on the part of the worker and on the part of the employer. So we're facing something that isn't easily legislated, uh, probably isn't part of any bill, but it has to do with a discourse in a normative social environment that creates an overworking worker. Um, thank you very much, and thank you, Elsa, for bringing up culture, because besides mandates, besides incentives, I mean, the truth is, is that while law cannot legislate culture, law absolutely impacts culture in lots of different ways, um, and that's part of the sort of creative thinking. And again, in terms of culture, there's no doubt that and um, that Sloan created a um, a culture around work family that we heard about from the the previous panel, and that many of the folks who got funded from that went on to do things, for example, in poverty, things that were different from the middle income families that the Sloan research was was looking. Hi, I have to just say one thing here. Yeah. I suppose mainly because no one knows who I am, I can say this. Let's stop this with this issue about the middle class. We have people in our sample that are earning under $30,000 a year. They can't pay their bills. They can't take care of their kids. The issue is that when we talk about the middle class, we're talking about a very, very large range of people who are facing all kinds of constraints in their lives. And we really have to get off of this notion that it's just a middle class sample so that you're thinking about people earning over 100000 These are not people earning over 100,000. For the most part, these are people earning less than that. They have enormous pressures, both financial and social, and it's very difficult for them to arrange their lives. And these are the people, basically, that are part of what makes America, America. These are the people that are employed in most of the jobs that we have today. So let's think actually about whether there can be a better term. What I was trying to get to with that, and I'm moving to Susan next in terms of my question, what I'm trying to get to is 
what we were trying to get to yesterday with the two panels. That is that for some people, the issue in terms of workplace flexibility is they're working too much. Not that they're making a whole lot of money, but they're working too much. And what they're looking for in terms of their FWA, their flexible work arrangement, is some way to get flexibility in their schedule. Some way to be able to, you know, um, start earlier or later or reduce some of their hours. So it's, that's what we're trying to capture in terms of that survey, right? As opposed to other workers who that's not their problem that they're working too many hours. The problem is they don't have enough hours that they can work and that the ones that they are working are, are um, they don't know when it's going to happen. Okay, so, but I think that's right, that we may play into something that's not good politically by saying low income, middle income. Now, I'm not sure if we did it any better by saying hourly and salaried, but you can see that's sort of our effort. But what I want to say here, though, is in terms of what's important to us from a policy perspective is using the data that's coming, Barbara, out of your 500 family survey, right, from folks, as well as from Maureen's, um, as well as from, yeah, Maureen Perry Jenkins, 300 family study, right, and sort of what's, and some of those will be similar and some will be different. So given that, Susan, I want to turn to you and say from your research perspective, what do you see as both some of the opportunities and challenges for policy in this area? But first, I want to start with another correction, too. <laughs> another thing that I've heard here is the idea that kind of low-income families have all these resources. <laughs> um, not the ones I know are <laughs> in study. And so I think a major theme that comes through is that we're talking about, you know, working poor, working families, and it should be spread very widely. And that when we divide up these two different sectors, we create these divisions that play a role in making it hard to move public policy through, because these kinds of issues affect families at both ends and in the middle of the income distribution. So, so what I'm going to focus on are some of the challenges of that I see in terms of implementing flexibility into hourly jobs. Um, that's how I'd like to spend my uh, five minutes. You know, how do we do this in a meaningful way? And what I see as one of the biggest challenges to implementing meaningful flexibility in hourly jobs are employer practices that seek to keep a very tight link between variations in consumer demand and labor costs. Uh, I've studied a lot of jobs in retail, hospitality, transportation, and financial services, and you know, for example, in many retail stores, when sales go down, workers go home. And a common practice is to post schedules a few days in advance, and when they are posted a couple weeks in advance, there's often many uh, changes that are made to those schedules because, you know, demand can exceed or, you know, disappoint expectations on which those schedules are made. So under those circumstances, that is when you know, jobs are really designed to minimize labor costs, increasing workers' control over the timing of their work hours can have some unintended consequences. And specifically what we've found in our research is that hourly workers are often at, at a risk of an earnings penalty when they restri restrict their availability for work. That is when they say when they can and cannot work. And this is because very few employers guarantee a minimum number of hours to workers in hourly jobs. We have laws governing mid minimum wage. We do not have laws governing minimum hours. And the number of hours worked in both um, part-time jobs and increasingly in full-time hourly jobs can flex, <laughs> as they call it now, between, you know, in pretty wide variations. Um, we find that, you know, workers in full-time jobs are regularly short at hours, and in part-time jobs, the, the hour fluctuations are huge, down to zero for maybe some, several weeks of the year. Uh, we call these no-time jobs. Um, so you're on the payroll, but you don't get a paycheck. 
So when there are no guaranteed minimum hours, you know, this worker control over the timing of hours can backfire. And a lot of what employers will do is they will tend to guarantee that you will not be scheduled for hours that you indicate that you're unavailable. But they don't guarantee that you will be scheduled during those times when you are available. And so and many a manager will tell you in this, you know, in these workplaces today, uh, you know, the number one, it's not skills, it's not education. Education, it is the number one human capital skill is availability <coughs> to work fluctuating hours. <laughs> and they will schedule workers with greater avail availability for more hours. And, of course, that's really important in hourly jobs because income is a function of not only wage rates but the number of hours that workers work. Um, so I just think it's really important as we move forward, and I'm so glad to see that Sloan is <laughs> including this broader idea here of, uh, you know, including hourly workers uh, in uh, kind of, and, and, you know, on moving forward into kind of flexibility, uh, which has not been the case, I have to say. Um, so we have to just be really careful that the flexibility options that have been largely developed <coughs> off of the overwork, right, side of the story, that if we try to apply those at the other end, they might not fit as well as we think, and they may have these unintended uh, consequences. <coughs> a lot of the flexibility options right now are really focused on loosening up rigid job structures, and the jobs that I see, are they're already loose. So just two basic um, directions uh, for intervention. One is, Chris mentioned this yesterday, is that I just think there's a lot of other modifications to improving scheduling practices other than adding, you know, in addition, I guess, to increasing workers' control, we focus on predictability that's now included in, you know, a way of providing flexibility into hourly jobs. There's a whole bunch of other things that could be done because one of the, you know, the best things is that there's so many problems with lower-level jobs. There are so many possible points of intervention that we might focus on. Um, another, and I think the overall... Um, idea I would like to plant with you is for us to find ways to pay, to work with employers to pass the stability that is in the business on to workers you know there's an idea that you know consumer demand fluctuates so much but in our study uh, about 70 percent for example in the retail stores we study the demand stays the same. 30% varies, right? I mean, somebody has to open up a store every day. Somebody has to close it. You need so many people in a store just for shrinkage, right? And so if you structure that in, there's only about 30% of it that really varies seasonally or across the week. But you would never know that by looking at many employer practices, that the schedulings just look like chaos. So I think one of our biggest challenges is to find ways to deliver, to transform instability into flexibility for our hourly workers. Well, definitely, and, and I think you hopefully have gotten this from some of the political conversation in the beginning, and we're going to end with um, some political conversation, that certainly for folks um, in policymakers, um, they care about the wide range of families. I mean, they are all in their constituency. Um, and so um, they do care about unintended consequences if you're you know, trying to push one policy that doesn't fit that group. I mean, that is part of the challenge of doing policy development, right? And a lot of what this conference has been about is how do you do the intersection between research and business practice so that you, in fact, produce thoughtful public policy? Okay, so we're going to end with a bunch of people sort of, you know, in those areas. Okay, so we're going to have Ellen Galinsky and then Carol Joyner and then Sharon Daly, okay? So, because, I, I mean, you've heard from some of the big names in the research world up here, okay? So I think you're getting a sense of the richness, maybe, of the research that has been done. So, um, and Ellen, you, uh, you're the president and co-founder of Families and Work Institute, well known to everyone in this audience. Um, you're a real premier example of someone who's able to translate research into media. Um, last week, with the release of your new report, you were on ABC World News Tonight, Marketplace Radio, Wall Street Journal on Online and the Newhouse News Service. Um, thinking about the data that you folks have collected from your surveys over the past decade, um, 
So um, what would be some of the main data highlights you would want to bring out? And, and maybe even uh, if you want to diverge from whatever you might have prepared, um, maybe some comment on a way to think about uh, family in a more continuous, seamless way, since certainly in your surveys, which are the one survey that really does ask a lot of these specific work family questions, um, you get the whole range in your in your um, data set. So why don't you um, expound a bit on that in, in your five minutes? Okay. Um, thank you very much. Um, since so much of this discussion has been about translating research to action, I actually did veer a little bit um, in what I plan to say. And I'd like to talk about the philosophy that we have at the Families and Work Institute for making that happen. We didn't want to, even though we do the two major studies of employees and of employers that look at the complexity of people's lives on and off the jobs, um, we didn't want to do yet another series of research reports that everyone's too busy to read. We wanted to make sure that, that they let to action. So 12 years ago, we convened a group um, who had had real experience in creating change that lasts. Uh, they were the people who had done things like designated driver, stop smoking, uh, wearing seat belts uh, from a variety of fields, and we asked them the, for their advice on what we should and shouldn't do. Uh, as a research organization. So I'd like to talk a little bit about our evolution in that way. The first thing they said is that do expect that there's a long time in creating change, but you have to know, you have to plant the seeds of what you want from the beginning of what you're doing. Um, the second lesson, there are eight lessons, and I'm going to do four of them. The second lesson was you need to know what's going on. You need to know what people think. You need to know what's happening um, in this. And and uh, the for us, that's the, the, you know we find that out through our data. We ask both about attitudes and we ask about people's experience. And we could see in the last time that we did our nationally representative study of the U.S. workforce that there were a lot of problems with employees, that 39 percent were not fully engaged in their job. We've been talking a lot about engagement, that more than half weren't really satisfied with their jobs, that about a third were going to make a serious effort to find a new job in the year, about a third were experiencing one or more symptoms of clinical depression, um, that the conflict for women in managing work and family life had stayed the same over 25 years, but for men it had shot up. So um, the... Um, Next message is, so we've got a problem um, with the workforce. The next message, um, the, the next thing that we learned is um, the importance of messages. Um, and there again, we frame what we're doing uh, um, within the context of our research. So we have seen that in order to address these multiple issues, we need to look at what is an effective workplace. Jennifer who uh, Swanberg yesterday, who did work with us, um, um, came out of that thinking that we've had for a long time. So we've been looking for a, lo for a long time, first in our national study of the U.S. workforce, about what is an effective workforce. And our first studies found six components. They were things like um, giving people autonomy. We've talked a lot about that, autonomy and control. But learning opportunities, uh, supervisors, Jennifer talked about that, supervisors who support uh, workers to be successful on the job as do coworkers, um, and being involved in making decisions that affect your life and flexibility. And I think the stopping power of that message is that flexibility is one of the components of an effective workplace. That is not what people expected. Um, we could see in our research that if people work for these um, workplaces that had this kind of, uh, that were effective in this way, only 3% were not fully engaged uh, in, in helping their organization succeed, and 82% had a very high level of engagement. We went on to look at the low-wage, low-income workforce and um, came up with a different series of, of um, characteristics of a supportive workplace. Um, that was in our national study data. And we define people in that group as not only being low wage, but also living in low income families. And I think that's important. Some of the same things, but adding to that the issue of financial stability, um, which is what Susan has talked about. The importance of having good benefits and having um, 
and, uh, and having um, a good salary. In our latest study, which will be released uh, very shortly, where we've done a study of senior and pipeline leaders in, um, in six global uh, companies, we've not only, we've expanded this to look at not only w what is an effective workplace, and we've come up with six things, but what do people value the most? And this is a factor analysis of many, many, many questions that we ask them. Interestingly enough, a supportive workplace was most highly valued. Challenging jobs was next most highly valued. But then having a good fit between life on and off the job was the third most valued by the most senior and pipeline leaders. There it was not just flexibility, which is very important, but it was being able to focus on what you're supposed to be doing. And we found that when people's jobs reflected their values, the difference in retention between women and men disappeared, the difference between pipeline and senior leaders disappeared, and the difference in retention between people around the <coughs> likely retention around the world uh, disappeared. So um, I think that that framing is important. Um, then we need to know um, about the messengers, unexpected messengers. And our purpose was to translate uh, research into action. And so we um, have become, in a sense, an intermediary where we have have taken the results of our research and now we're funding places all over the country to experiment and we test the efficacy of what they're doing. It's not just, uh, it's not advocacy, we're really trying to seed the change of what we've seen in our research and we are now, um, we are now um, funding 30 places around the country to create a core leadership group, bringing together the unusual parties like we've had at this session to bring about change, to use our national study of employers to um, actually uh, use that as a benchmark. Uh, if companies are in the top 20 percent of, of uh, nationally, they self-apply for this award, um, then they give a survey to their employees and they win with two-thirds, uh, based two-thirds on the employees. We're now doing all sorts of outreach of the wonderful ideas that we're hearing from employers all over the country. With my colleagues um, Shani Peer and Lois Back on here, we've created a, a guide, which we see as like a restaurant guide, uh, for finding good new ideas for making work work. And they're not just the big corporations. They're small companies, they're mid-sized companies, they're large companies, they employ all levels of income. So we're doing the same thing um, on issues related to the low-wage workforce, where we're funding employers to connect uh, through employers to connect employees with um, uh, publicly funded benefits and a continuum of benefits from those that the company offers to those that are publicly funded. So our, our, these are four of the eight lessons for bringing about change that, that sticks. But our message is not only to have the data, and I hope you all will go and look at the data that we found from the National Study of Employers, but to also find ways of translating it to action and then testing what works in that action or not. Great, and one of the, definitely, um, the places that has been a real crucible for action has been the unions and has been religious um, institutions that um, are involved with um, social justice issues. So I think it's quite appropriate that we are ending with Carol Joyner, who um, ba basically, who founded the 1199 Employer Child Care Fund, okay, was the brain behind that, is the past president of the Child Care Corporation, um, and that now has 13,000 families in it, um, and Sharon Daly, who was um, a lobbyist for Catholic Charities USA um, and National Conference on Catholic Bishops, um, do, and very active in the passage of the FMLA when she was at the uh, National Conference on Catholic Bishops. So really to both of you in, in terms of this, I mean I, I mean, I know I gave you other questions as well, which, you know, like what can we learn from the unions and uh, do, should we be optimistic politically, Sharon? But I, I guess I really also want you guys to respond to some of the stuff that's come up here and then we're going to do about 10 minutes of just comments, questions from you guys. But to respond to this question of how do we create more of a seamless sense of that there are the people in this country, regardless of what category they're called, middle income, low income, salaried, hourly, okay, that there are people who need change, okay? So how do we both create that seamlessness and yet not have the problem of having a solution that works for one that's not gonna work for the other? Okay, because there are similarities and there are differences. And when you're thinking about policy, 
you have to be attuned to that. So, Carol and then Shannon. Yes, Sharon. Um, first of all, thank you, hi, for having me here. And this has been a very interesting conversation. I have to say it is a little unfair to, on two or three occasions in a row, have to speak behind Ellen. But um, <laughs> I think it's happened the last time. Um, I'll try to survive. I'll try to survive that. Um, I, w I want to start uh, before I get directly into responding to things people have said here, some of my comments actually are related. Um, it's just by saying, just like business, I think it was raised yesterday that businesses are not a monolith, neither are unions. So it's very difficult to talk about um, the priority for unions and where work life falls in the priority for unions because they're simply not. I remember, you know, two or three years ago the headlines were filled with the breakup of the AFL-CIO and we saw then that unions differ greatly on their approach to organizing, on the priority. They put on politics, on, um, and on a host of other issues. However, one of the things that I think um, unions have sort of been very like-minded about from day one is thinking about um, family values and the way in which work is, can be used and, and income can be used to build the American family. And so um, it, it, 30, 40 years ago, that was thought of as you know, a living wage, health benefits, and pension. Um, and then the next phase sort of came in, you know, as Susan certainly spoke about and it's been mentioned several times here, uh, how do you control your work hours? How do you make sure that you get the amount of work that you need in order to put food on the table? How do you make sure that that work is consistent and you have some measure of control over it? So um, having said that, I think unions are pretty much like-minded, if I could speak for all of them <laughs> on those issues. Um, in terms of moving the flexibility issue higher on the priority for unions, we have a, little, a couple of obstacles I just want to mention fairly quickly. And one is um, the, the notion of reframing the word flex time. Um, we've heard of you know fake flex. We've heard that mentioned in the um, Labor Project for Working Families flex pack. But I don't think that we truly understand the extent to which unions have you know waged battle against the notion of you know variable scheduling and the havoc that that's wreaked on American families. And so um, the the idea of you know I've got, I've talked to several labor leaders about this project to get their input you know how can we get labor at the table I certainly am not you know clearly you know Netsy and I are not the sole representatives of the labor movement and so um, they, they, they're often very concerned they're concerned because they've spent millions and millions of dollars on the play in this word and you know wondering whether or not this is really a scheme for controlling the bottom workers to increase the bottom line um, and so I, I think in your draft that you sent around regarding, um, I think it was re- uh, framing uh, and, and work, uh, workplace flexibility and the terminology. I think we have to look very closely at that. And and you deliberately left out, you know, the explicit language regarding how flexibility has got to. Um, a, we have to take into account the needs of both the employer and the employee. I think that has to be explicit. It has to be bolded. It has to be highlighted. And if you can get, if you can borrow those iTunes um, chat. <laughs> with the headphones on, you know, and let them dance by those words, I think the labor movement might pay attention some because um, people are very concerned about that. And so I don't want to spend, you know, all of my time on that issue, but it's a huge issue, and I want us to walk away with an appreciation for how large it is. Um, the second obstacle is that of priorities. And so uh, big priorities for the labor movement is how do you organize and, you know, in, in a global economy? How do you make that happen? It's a new day for organizing in the labor movement. Um, immigration, race and social justice issues, issues of poverty, and of course health care looms all the time. So we have to figure out, I think flex time is in all of those issues. It exists in all those issues. I don't think that it's a big enough issue separate from them 
to, to, to become um, a calling point for the labor movement, but we need to tease out where flex time lives inside of those issues and really make that a, a case for the labor movement. The other thing is that um, with, despite all of those obstacles, you need to know that unions have been negotiating flex time for a very long time, but largely for, like in the broader society, largely for technical and professional workers, almost never for wage earners. Um, and then finally, some examples of what, what we can learn from um, uh, unions around flex time, the, the things that they've done, what, what the rest of society can learn is that bargaining, whether it's formal collective bargaining or just sitting down, as many companies do, working out differences, working out scheduling, having collaborative um, understanding about how work gets done, under, bringing employees into that conversation, I think is a very important tool to moving forward. And the unions have been doing that, you know, with employers for over 100 years. Sometimes it's you know, a, a positive experience, sometimes it's not, but it always results, often, usually results in an agreement of some sort. And then the last point that I want to make is that the other thing that we can look at is from what comes from that, which is a host of flex time um, uh, contract language, and the Sloan Foundation has funded the Labor Project for Work and Family, which I'm on the board of, um, to put together a category, uh, uh, to categorize all of the flex time language in, in unions in this country. And so they're coming out with that type of um, electronic data in the very near future, and we can all learn lessons from that, whether we're in unions or not, because the contract language really does codify sort of the steps for how it happens, and, and it deals with a lot of the particular issues with regard to um, building flex time into corporate life. Thanks. Thank you. And we are also very much looking forward to Nancy's uh, database of that as a way of getting some ideas of what happens when you, in fact, can facilitate a conversation between employers and employees. And I'm very glad that um, you mentioned in your rush there at the end, but you got it, um, the race and social justice issues. And I said I think that's... Um, quite appropriate in terms of um, ending at least this part of the conversation with Sharon Daly. Um, as someone who grew up as an Orthodox Jew, I was taught very much about tikkun olam, about fixing the world. That was sort of part of what we needed to do when we lived here on this earth. And um, I learned from Sharon Daly about Catholic social teaching, which um, was basically the same thing um, and and really just uh, learned an, an amazing amount from her and I just need to say she really is one of my personal heroes because Sharon Daly has done more for poor people in this country over the last 30 years than than anyone will ever know except for those of you now in this room so Sharon <laughs> I love you too high yeah. <laughs> don't listen I mean that's just so ridiculous but <clears throat> I, I want to start with the fact of how thrilled I am that at this conference on these work and family issues, workplace flexibility, the very first panel focused on the, on the problems and opportunities for low-wage workers, for wage earners, and that throughout this conference there's been quite a lot of discussion about that. That is so unusual in my experience, especially conferences on academics on big issues. It usually starts with everybody who's not poor and then the poor are an asterisk. You know, and I think this has been just such a breakthrough in policy discussion on this set of issues. I'm, I'm just thrilled. I thought that Jennifer and Maureen and now Susan and Timer and Lonnie and Ellen all focused in their presentations on how important that is. And that's deeply important to me. And I think it's deeply important to people in the religious community who might become allies and maybe powerful allies in advancing this set of issues. Um, I'm sitting here hoping that Heidi is right. <laughs> I sat on boards with Heidi and worked with Heidi on a lot of issues for a lot of years. And I certainly hope that she is right. But I am um, maybe like all the generals who fought the fight the last war, you know, <laughs> to our detriment and disaster. But I am thinking about the last time there was a new Democratic administration and a Democratic Congress, and all of the domestic policy achievements, except for the state child health insurance program, occurred in that first year. 
In that first year, we got $24 billion of new aid over five years for low-income people, and it was not offset by cuts in other programs, the earned income tax credit, immunizations, child welfare, and feeding the hungry. It was an incredible breakthrough. That was also, as Heidi pointed out, when we finally got the Family Medical Leave Act enacted into law. But then we had the health care debacle, the Democrat Republicans took over the Congress, and things went downhill, and we did not get any new significant achievements. And so I think there will be a window at the beginning of the next administration, and that health care may in fact suck all of the oxygen out of the room, both for employers, employee groups, labor groups, senior groups, children's advocates, the religious community. And so find, to me, finding some piece of the workplace flexibility agenda that we might be able to advance in those that first year or two is very critical. And I don't know if we've come close enough to the point on any of the parts of that three-pronged workplace flexibility agenda, aside from the paid leave that, that Heidi talked about so persuasively, which has been around for a while. There's a consensus built. There's a coalition. And there might really be a chance to move on that. But if you ask if I um, think that you all are deluded, no. But I think you have to pick your targets. And I think, you know, my, in my experience, if a piece of legislation cannot be talked about in three points, you're not going to win. <laughs> that was part of the Clinton health care plan. It was so complicated, like a Rube Goldberg contraption, that <laughs> nobody could remember what the fourth and fifth point was. You know, when the talking heads went on TV, it was like, oh, now what was that other part of it? You have to, and so I think while this is very important for us to be talking as a policy matter about this very broad range of workplace flexibility issues, and especially, as the last few speakers have pointed out, how this way this is going to be applied for different populations at different times times, but you're going to have to pick targets if, if you ask me. I think also a very important challenge, as I tried to raise so ineffectively yesterday, is that if this set of issues continues to be talked about as the government helping us with our personal problems, yeah. <laughs> we are not going to make very much advance. Yeah. In my view, raising children and taking care of the elderly are not personal stuff. It is the basic work of society. And so society, through government, has a role in protecting workers and their families from the degradation of unfair work practices or just unthinking work structures that keep people from fulfilling those important roles in society. So it's not about me feeling bad because I miss my granddaughter's school play. It's about whether children are going to drop out of school because mom can't get time off to come to the school when they're threatening to, th to throw that kid out for um, failing to, to meet some requirement. It's about mothers being able to go and make sure that their children get those individual education plans to deal with their learning disabilities, for example. It's about the need of our society for people to be able to play these roles. I'm not saying you don't give those individual heart-rending examples, and I spent 30 years going around Capitol Hill talking about those examples, but part of this needs to be reframing. Why should the full majesty and force of the federal government intervene in the marketplace in this way? What is at stake? And it's not just about it feeling, making us feel less conflicted. It's about society needs these changes. And I urge you all to think about this. Part of the reason I think this is all women here, and mostly white women, is that it is framed most of the time as a con conflict between work and family, when it is, in fact, how do we meet the needs of our society? I hope that's a little clearer than when I spoke yesterday. In, in my Catholic social teaching tradition, the very first and most fundamental and most important test of any public policy initiative is how does it affect the weakest, the poorest, the most vulnerable in society. And I'm very pleased that we have had these discussions about how to tailor all of this to those people at the bottom. Because for those people, they don't, you know, since welfare reform, people don't have any other resources. You know, the maximum in any state that a, wo a woman can be on welfare in her lifetime is five years. In most states, it's two years or less. 
and everybody has to go to work either for pay, in which case if you do, you lose your welfare benefits, or without pay to work off some value attributed to those benefits. Mm -hmm. Women at the bottom, very bottom of the labor market who are on and off welfare do not have any kind of protection that they had before the mid-1990s. And they are the most vulnerable because when they have to take time off, they often do lose their jobs or they lose income, as Susan pointed out. So I urge you to cap more attention to that set of issues, which I think are very compelling. And if you want to, I think, raise support in the labor movement, in the religious community, and other sectors, having that broader focus on what society needs, and especially what will help the poor to live in dignity, are two components of how to win. Thanks very much. <laughs> Well, thank you. And um, actually, what I am going to do in terms of um, instead of taking questions here, the, the, what I hope you do is take from here and start the conversation among yourselves um, in terms of reactions uh, to some of this. And then we will have some time for Q&A um, at lunch. And so I want this wrapping in your, in your head. Um, Oh, good. Oh, okay, good. So we have five minutes. I, I wasn't remembering where we were having lunch, but we are having it here. Okay. <laughs> wasn't sure why that was going to be needing to give you directions to the faculty dining room. Um, well, in that case, we have five minutes before you can get up and stretch and get some food, in which case someone, anyone who's been dying to say something, um, especially maybe on this last point of, from our perspective in terms of policy, we at least, now I'll just speak for Workplace Flexibility 2010, um, which, by the way, make it very clear, was the, was the premise for Workplace Flexibility 2010 when it started in 2003. Right? What we said in 2003 is we are going to be looking across income, across race, across job occupations. You know, um, It wasn't the Catholic social teaching piece of we are going to be... Um, you know, looking the most at that, that wasn't. We, it was just, but it was a very broad um, view. And, and that workplace flexibility was something that we felt everyone could benefit from, even though it might look different for different um, sectors and groups. So, um, so that is certainly something that has been um, a desire from day one. And I guess in terms of some conversation for the next five minutes before we can go collect food if anyone wants to um, either comment on how to do that in an effective, intelligent way <laughs> um, or any other comments that came out of the round table, let's, um, let's get a show of hands and, and, and take some of those questions or comments. Kara? And then let me, if I'll see if another hand, I'll let you know. Go ahead, Kara. <laughs> Well, I just think that um, one of the things that has come up for me, and I, I think a lot about our FACE retirement working group, but also what it sounds like you're doing with the NAC as well, is that really a lot of what we're doing is trying to figure out what the actual question is. And it differs. It can differ to figure out what the actual question is. Is it that you want to protect one set of people over group of people over another, or are you trying to look at different aspects of the issue, but defining what that question is from the get-go, I think is really important. And I don't really have a comment on how to do that, but it <laughs> seems to be an important part of the process of figuring out where you go next. And, okay, in terms of defining the question. Um, other comments from um, folks in the audience, and then I will also, if there are comments from folks here within the next, but let's, let's get the, anyone from in the audience uh, to anything that was said at the round table, or, yep, Bob Drago. Not quite the last word. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to say, um, I, I remember being at a conference probably 10 years ago on these issues, and, and uh, and somebody said, we've known for 30 years what we need to do. That's not the problem. The problem is getting the politics to actually happen. And what a lot of the people on the, the stage have done with a lot of great research and eloquence, and, and what I've tried to do as well, is often look at an issue and just repackage it with the research. For example, ask, what happens to women who stay out of the workforce for three to five years, which Heidi's looked at? You know, what, and their wage, you know, their wages suffer a lot. 
Um, it's it's just it's it's not the most intellectually exciting thing to do, but if you want to do policy relevant research, you have to look at some old questions and shed some new light on you know what can we do and how will it benefit the society broadly, different groups and so forth. So, great. Other comments from the floor. Other comments from the floor. Comments um, from our panel? Yes, okay, so I've got Ellen, Heidi, Phyllis. Great, okay. Um, in the last two days, we've done a lot of talking about the individual or the individual family and then society. I want to add a middle level in there, which is the community. And one of the things that we've learned from working now in 30 communities into 36 next year is that there's not just a business case for a company or a business case, in a sense, for a family, um, as Bob was talking about, but there really are community business cases. And with our colleagues um, at the Center for uh, Competitive Workforce and, and Patricia Kempthorne from Twiga, we've been out in uh, at Twiga, we've been out in communities and there are real business reasons uh, or societal reasons for a community to address this. For example, Flex in the City in Houston uh, is reducing air traffic pollution and helping to create a, a greener, more sustainable economy, which in, as gas prices escalate, uh, it's that's really important to families as well as to the community. So I think that think about the, the, the individual, the family, the community, the society, because uh, we've seen amazing reasons why communities are getting involved um, in moving toward these issues. Great. Heidi. Just wanted to comment that, of course, unions are instrumental in guaranteeing minimum hours for a number of workers. Um, one example I happen to know well, a friend of mine works for the um, Opera House Orchestra at the Kennedy Center. And it's not a full-time job because if a company, like an opera company, comes in with their own orchestra, they're out of work. And, but they have to be there for when the things that come in need an orchestra. And they have a union and they have a minimum hours that the center pays for whether they work or not. And when they are on layoff, which happens between shows, they have their own little um, employment counselor down at the D.C. unemployment office and they know how to get the unemployment benefits to, to this unique group of workers. So that is something that unions uh, do work on. And then even in some non-union contexts like Starbucks, um, they, you know, do have a really affordable health insurance plan for their workers who work more than 20 hours, and therefore they work pretty hard to try to schedule each worker for 20 hours uh, in order that they will be eligible for that health insurance. Phyllis. I think the discussion today really points to the fact that we can't just sort of get on a flexibility bandwagon and say, oh, we passed that, you know, no matter how small or minimal it is. And that the opposite, that we need to also think of stability as well as flexibility, that what you're talking about oftentimes is what Lee Rainwater called years and years ago, like the stream of resources that you have, not just your income right now. I mean, we could think of that well to, as the stream of time too that you can anticipate so so I think we need to move uh, maybe uh, in ways that are inclusive of these issues instead of dividing that that one thing about universal health care is that it's universal mm -hmm. and what we want to propose are universal policies finally just to get on the I think the health and health care bandwagon I've been framing some of these things as toxic job ecologies that are that are not good for health and we know that we are seeing that in the data and it, that it becomes a public health issue uh, the the uh, the epidemic or the public health issue of our time is stress, not uh, not uh, cholera, and we need to look at it and frame it that way. Well, thank you very much. I actually love that as the last word, because I will tell you that what I have gotten from this roundtable, this is what I always feel is what's good about a meeting, an event, if you've heard one or two new ideas, that's pretty amazing right there, okay? But sometimes the confluence and convergence of ideas, and certainly for a long time, we, 
I, I'll just say, thought about, you know, we have our segmented, you know, whether it's race, class, income, because of the different needs and wanting to make sure that those different needs were, were um, accounted for in the questions that we ask. But I think at least what I've gotten from this roundtable is both the need to figure out some term that will, in fact, cover both a real umbrella term, and I like the toxic job ecology term, because that's the problem, and what's toxic in one job might be different from another, but it's toxic. And once you say ecology, it makes it very clear that that's not an individual personal thing to fix. I mean, you can't do it that way. It is a structural ecological problem. We need a structural response which is what all of us are in the business of trying to think about, hence working for change. But we can't do it without food. So first, a huge round of applause for our round table.